Well, good morning. I could, I could hear you worshiping. I knew that uh, you were in the room and had come with your heart full to just to glorify God. So now that I'm up here and can see you, wow, uh, thank you for being here today. Let me mention, you know, our new kids ministry is our new kids pastors are just getting uh, in place and uh, that's happening. The team are working. We have uh, uh, lots and lots of work going on through the week uh, to prepare for a new launch of kids ministry in uh, January, February-ish, the new space. And one of the things we're doing to address safety concerns that we had is to get all the children over into this building. Would that not be amazing? Would that be great? So all the kids over here. So we need your help. Uh, if you want to text an offering to do that, you can text uh, kids. Um, and um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, someone mentioned to me that um, one of the uh, um, person that's in the know, there are only three or four churches in the whole city that actually do textable giving. And did you know that our, your giving is, f- we, we have 50% now, more than 50% comes online and through the phone. I don't, I don't know, I don't know if you've made the conversion yet, but I would tell you probably 10 years from now, um, there'll be a lot of phone giving. So you, if you want to make the switch, you can do that. It is, it is free and easy. So I mention that because the kids just put, if you just type in the keyword, the computer knows that and the printout comes uh, to the ladies and they're able to attribute that. I believe we're, uh, oh, well, we're over $30,000 now headed toward a $90,000 goal. So praise God. So help us with that. When you see things like um, Thanksgiving outreach, we're asking you to help, but we're going to do it anyway. 250 families are going to be fed. Uh, We're going to engage in that. So when you give Sunday morning and you're just putting in general offerings, you're helping uh, helping us to do that where we can back up ministries uh, that are happening. I think the Legacy may be having a service tonight too. I don't know. Uh, First of the month. So I would assume they are at 6 o'clock if you are in that tribe, feel free to, uh, to, to show up. Um, I'm uh, real excited then to make this announcement then for our kids pastor, who is obviously over with the children uh, just getting started today. But he just sent me uh, this note for us to mention to you. It's tonight at 5 o'clock. It'll go for one hour in this room right back here. Anyone who's been in kids ministry in the past, Um, or is currently in the ministry, or God's been tweaking your heart about getting engaged with children and helping, you can meet them uh, in room 100 tonight between 5 and 6 o'clock and come just listen. There's no commitment. You can come and hear the vision, kind of where we're going. Um, Pastor Clint is uh, overseeing the construction of this, and there's a lot of stuff going on, so we're excited about that. If you're interested, I promised uh, him I would uh, make you aware of it. Well, you're ready to get into the Word? I've got, I have something uh, so strong to share on my heart that I want to take you on a journey with me. I was thinking about the title for this message and um, how it all came about, and I just probably would just title it Divine Healing, that this, today you're going to hear my doctrine of divine healing, Um, and I'm going to walk into that. One of the things that sets us apart as a church is we believe that God still heals the human body. Can you say amen? We do believe that. And uh, part of the reason why I'm leaning into that is because your, your worship pastor who worked uh, with the team on the internet and, and um, um, selected these songs or whatever, she is in a, uh, a physical crisis. It has been now um, oh, three and a half years, uh, kind of feels like about four years, uh, three and a half years of uh, fighting um, Hodgkin's lymphoma and um, the cancer is uh, accelerating and growing. And uh, the, you know, you, you discover a lump on your neck, and so those lumps are, are just uh, swelling. And and um, but her lungs, her lungs have um, just um, not been responding. They're not doing well. And so we are we are in a crisis uh, as a as a family. But we also, uh, like Whitney, are uh, full of confidence and faith and trust in the Lord. And even though there's no medical answer uh, that can help us now, we're in this place where we're okay with just trusting ourselves into the healing hands of Jesus who still makes house calls. Can you say amen? So we're believing for that. And uh, she, is, she is watching. The, uh, their, the purpose of my message today, I'm not sending her any messages to try and encourage her. 
We don't need encouragement right now. What we need is a healing from cancer. We don't even need her lungs to be better. And so I, I just prophesy. I'm just going, I just believe by Christmas that we're going to have a Christmas miracle and she'll be standing right here leading worship. And we want you to believe with us you know, and it's a big decision when you're a public leader. Do you take the people on the journey? Do you, do you let them in or do you keep them at bay and you suffer privately? And so this was her decision many years ago that she would allow people in on the journey and, and uh, she's done that. So she doesn't need your sympathy. Alan doesn't need your sympathy. They are full of courage, full of hope, full of confidence. Um, and uh, But the, uh, the news uh, they received on Friday afternoon is just not, not good. And, uh, but it's not par for the course. It's, it hasn't been good. For three years, um, the, we've just had one good report in three years. And uh, so um, this is why my, my wife and I have kind of uh, just come to this place. We're, we're not dealing with cancer. We're, we're, we're dealing with something in the spiritual realm that we are, that we are uh, calling attention to because I believe in this city uh, and in this region of the United States, there needs to be a place where people know miracles still can happen, that God is still active. Because we can shift our doctrine over into not believing in the miraculous. We can shift over and try to comfort one another as we hold on to the journey through life. But this is not what I see in the scripture. So today, I want to take you to uh, some text messages. You're going to have to, you're the, the text, I'm going to fly through this because uh, so much revelation, I promised I could go for several hours of what I believe that I'm uh, seeing in the scripture. So Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, when Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph, verse 19, in Egypt. Get up, the angel said, take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel because those who are trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warmed in a dream, here's another dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. This fulfilled what the prophet had said, he will be called a Nazarene. So I'm reading that, and I don't have time to tell you uh, why I was uh, into this uh, text, but the very next verse, put up chapter three. So the very next verse the very next thing Matthew says when he's writing is this. He says, In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, Repent of your sins, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is coming soon. And so when I was shifting into that, looking at it, it occurred to me that that's a 30 year gap. There's a 30 year silence. 30 years where Mary got a word from the Lord. Joseph had a dream, Mary has a dream, she gets a word, she conceives, pregnant by the Holy Spirit, delivers the word, kings come in, they honor Jesus, all of the celebration, shepherds in the field, angels come and sing over them, and now she starts raising Jesus, and we have a 30 year, basically a 30 year silent window. In other words, when God gives you a word, there will always be a period of silence. When God gives you a promise that's, that he's going to do something, you will always walk through a, a wilderness or a deserted place of having to wait. This is why the Gospel of Thomas is not in your Bible, and it's... it's uh, I believe the Gospel of Thomas is not only uh, sideways with Scripture, but I believe it's actually inspired by demons. Because in the Gospel of Thomas, what they say is that Jesus, as a child, would just pick up clay and throw it up in the air, and it would turn into birds and fly away. It's all kinds. But I believe the Gospel of Thomas is made to, to um, disrespect God's Word, and, and, and we've celebrated. We might as well bring in some Shakespeare and throw in some Stephen King for the dark stories, because when you begin to chip away at God's word, you, you have really begun to strip away the fundamentals. So anyway, we have this 30-year gap. And how can you preach out of this gap? What, what, is, what is this 30-year gap? So let me, let me give some things to you. First of all, before there was a world, there was a word. In the beginning was the word. Before there was a world that you and I could even stand on, there was a word. 
His name was Jesus. And God spoke the worlds into existence. Can't you say amen? In other words, before there was a cancer, there was a healing. Before there was a problem in your life, there was a deliverer that was already ready for your life. Before there was a crucifixion, there was already going to be a what? A resurrection. Don't you see? God precedes everything you're going through today. God has already seen not just what you're in in this moment, but he has made a provision for you so that you can pass through this moment into your destiny and all that God has, what promise for you. Now, this one thing I know, God is not into specifics. Look to your neighbor and say, that's a problem. So if, 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 if you say, you know what, God gave me this parking space up close to the mall, I'd say, no, he didn't. <laughs> God was trying to save you the 30 bucks and make you park in the back of the mall so your rear end had to walk all the way. God's trying to help you. But he is not into these, he's not into these specifics. Well, how do you know? How can you prove that, Abraham? Abraham, you're gonna be the father of generations. You're gonna have so many children up in the sky, right? And, but represented by these stars. And Abraham starts walking it out and Abraham gets so old, he's still not had a baby yet. It's so bad that when the word is delivered to him, his wife laughs. I don't know if that threatens your manhood, but you certainly don't want your wife laughing Y'all, are, y'all you're, you have a sterilized version. You need to read the Bible. She laughed like, that ain't going to happen. But God so healed Abraham and helped him that after Sarah died, Abraham got married again. I'm just saying. I'm just trying to help you all out. In other words, what God, when God gives you a promise and God empowers you, things change. You hold on to that. So God will tell you things generally and give you these words, but he's not going to give you the specifics. So we don't have the specifics of what happened in Jesus' life in those years. We got the little 12-year-old story and everybody hammers that all the way. That's all we have is one little nugget. What could Jesus possibly have been doing in all those years waiting? He was waiting for the appointed time of the Lord, right? He said when, the, when she called on him to do miracles and water to wine, he says, woman, it's not, my, it's not even my time. Don't do that. What are you saying? I believe every promise God has given you has a specific delivery moment, has a specific time when it's gonna be birthed, but it's already, it already exists in the supernatural waiting to be manifested in the natural. In other words, it didn't look like anything was happening in Jesus' life. That's why they said, that's why they were surprised. That's why he didn't, he didn't do any of the, these uh, miracle stories as a child. Why? Because they would have already flocked to him. You can see how they flocked to him when he's in his 30s. Do you follow my point? He wasn't doing miracles. That's the amazing thing. He was, he was a, a, a human being like you and me. He walked the earth like you and me. So just like the 30-year gap between the word being delivered in the physical realm, there is a delay of the activation of God's word. Let me show it to you. There's so many of these stories. I'm only going to highlight one. It's a little awkward, but it's rarely preached on. I thought I would touch on it. Luke 19. I'll go fast. You watch and listen. The crowd was listening to everything Jesus said, and because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to what? To correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. He said, a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together 10 of his servants and divided, them, uh, uh, divided among them 10 pounds of silver, saying, invest this for me while I'm gone. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, uh, verse 20, I'm going to jump to verse 20. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, master, I hid your money, kept it safe. I was afraid because you're a hard man to deal with. Now watch what he says. Watch what he says. Taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared, your your own words condemn you. In other words, Jesus told this parable, this story to illustrate 
what, what had happened to the Jewish people because they had rejected the prophets, rejected the word, rejected the promises that had been made to them and had hid, them, hid it away for themselves in fear of God rather than taking the word God gave and expanding and seeing the harvest of God's kingdom. That's why the man takes five and gets five more and so forth. And, the, and then the man who, who had that happen gets this man's talent. But what I find very interesting is that the word of the master to his servants who had to go away to a distant empire to be crowned, I believe Jesus is telling the story because he's saying, you, I have invested, the Father's invested a lot in you and you, you have turned it into a den of thieves. I don't have time to build all this, but you, you've turned it into a den of thieves, but I'm making a way for the Gentiles to come in. I'm making a way for, for others, for, for the whole world to be blessed through what I'm doing. But I want you to see this. After a long time, Jesus says, there was this gap between him investing this word or giving these, uh, the, these silver bags to these men and when he came back. We are instructed to remain faithful to believe the word that the master has spoken to us. Luke chapter 11, verse 50. Watch this. This is an awkward phrase on a Sunday morning. So that the blood of the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. He said, you didn't believe. In other words, God stands over his promises and God stands over his word to defend what he says. I'm not sure you're making the connection yet. I hope you'll get there. In other words, if God's given you a promise, you have no options other than to trust in the promise he's given you. You, you, are, you are in a place, if you don't trust in that, you find yourself in a, in a bad place. Let me say it a different way. God cares about the word that he delivers to you. Ephesians chapter one. Now watch this. This is for all of us in this room. All praise, be, uh, all praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and God chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. And God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us. And along with all wisdom and understanding, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us, what, in advance. In other words, before the foundation of the world, you were already chosen. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm chosen. I'm chosen. And he makes everything work out according to his plan. In other words, Jesus is the one who said, in this world you will have trouble, but what? Be of good cheer, I have. So, so we are in this place of needing to realize and live into the promises. You have to take what God has gifted you. This is leadership. Leadership is just simply taking what God has given you and moving it forward a little bit, as little bit as you can. Move it forward. So that's what stewardship is. You take what God has and you just, you advance it forward. Lord, I'm giving this, I'm giving this in honor back to you. It was all yours anyway. Giving this back to you and so forth. So since that's the case, you have to stand. God doesn't give just resources to you. He, his word is your resource. His word is your life. His promises to you are, are, are your sustenance, are the very thing your lives uh, need to live on and depend on. Let's jump to the Old Testament, Judges chapter 2, verse number uh, 1. Judges chapter 2, verse number 1. That's not it. Is it? Maybe it is. I have a different version. All right, let me read this one. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal, this is it, from Gilgal to Bochum and said to the Israelites, I brought you out of Egypt into this land that I swore to give your ancestors, and I said I would never break my covenant with you. For your part, you were not 
to make any covenants with the people living in this land. Now, let's get the context here. It's Judges. So Joshua, they've crossed over, and uh, they're following, and they're already starting to disobey, just like their ancestors did. And so the angel here is calling them to account. And he says, um, instead, you were to destroy their altars, but you disobey my command. Why did you do this? So now I declare that I will no longer drive out the people living in your land. They will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a constant temptation to you. In other words, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle bad. Now let's jump to Judges chapter 3. Crazy story. I shared it Wednesday night. I'm just going to hit the highlights. I have to read it though because it, it, it won't make sense if I don't. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. And the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. Eglon enlisted the Ammonites and the Amalekites as allies. Then he went out and defeated Israel, taking possession of Jericho, the city of Palms. And the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer. In other words, whatever's going into your life, the Lord is waiting on you to call out on him. The way the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord again is they just left him out of their life. We don't need God because we have medicine. We don't need God because we have money. We don't need, need God because we have jobs. We don't need God, really, because we have all the food we could want. This is how you do evil in the sight of the Lord. You don't include the Lord in your life. If you are not including the Lord in your life, you're doing evil. You're living according to your own laws and your own rules. That's harsh, I know. I hope it works out for you. Now, I believe there are many gods. Okay, talk to you in 50 years. Let's see how it went for you. You're gonna, you're gonna bank on a, you're gonna bank, this is, you know, nobody is, I want you to meditate and breathe deep. I do, I want you to do that. You should do that, I do that. But at the very center and the core is Jesus. Dave, David steadied his heart by focusing upon the Lord. So anyway, I'll finish this, I'm sorry. So his name was, the Lord raised up a rescuer. His name was Ehud, a left-handed man of the tribe of Benjamin. The Israelites sent Ehud to deliver their tribute now, why would he point out he's left-handed? It's only two reasons. One's for scholars, and I just want the scholars to know I already know that, and I can explain it, and I get, still get to the same outcome. But here's why I really believe. It's because his right hand was deformed. His right hand was deformed. Let's go to the next. Uh, uh, oh, no, here we go. Yeah. So uh, verse, uh, the Israelites sent Ehud to deliver to But So Ehud made a double-edged sword, a dagger that was about a foot long. And he strapped it to his right thigh, keeping it hidden under his clothing. This is why I think his arm was deformed, because he's going to be around the king, and they're not worried, because his weapon, his weapon is here. They're, if he's, he's left-handed, and they're looking, they're like, oh, no, he's clear on this side. He's not packing on this side. It's all good. Let, let him in. He brought the tribute money to Eglon, because they were servitude. They were in servitude to them, who was very fat. I wonder why he included that. That hurts my feelings. A very fat. It's a very fat king, it's because the Lord is uh, and the narrator here is wanting to show the excess he had been feeding off of God's people. He had fattened himself on the tribute that they brought to him. And what I would say to you is, I believe the devil has had the doctrine of divine healing long enough. We've been so turned off by personalities and so turned off by fakers that we have backed away from believing that God still does his word and what he said he would do. And I believe God wants to bring back into the center of the local church this place where you can come in and expect a miracle. Now, I, although I, I am the chairman of the board at Oral Roberts University, so I'm absolutely biased because I have seen that the Lord himself can do miracles. God can raise up a university built on the Holy Spirit. God can do that. But in this last generation, where he at? I don't see it. I don't see it. You know why we don't see it? Because we've not included the Lord in our churches. What we've included are marketing plans. And we have great little ways to organize ourselves and make ourselves feel better about what we're doing. But what we don't have centralized, the power's gone out at the local church. The power's out. 
The power's out in the local church because the pastor's power's out. The leader's out. But when, when we get plugged back in, so Ehud brought the tribute money to Eglon, who was very fat. After delivering the payment, Ehud started home with those who had helped carry the tribute. But when Ehud reached the stone idols, he turned back. He came to Eglon and said, I have a secret message for you. This is, is a, he, the king thinks it's a bribe. Notice, notice how Ehud didn't tell the devil everything he's going to do. So, oh, he lied. It's okay for y'all to lie to the devil because whatever you say, the devil's probably true anyway because the devil's a liar. The devil himself is a lie. Y'all afraid to say anything. I'm not afraid anymore. And he, and he says, I have a secret message for you. So the king commanded his servants, be quiet. And he sent all of them out of the room and Ehud walked over to the fat king who was sitting alone in a cool upstairs room. And Ehud... Uh, and so Ehud, where are we at? I'm back. Uh, so he said, I have a, okay, yeah, so there he is. I have a message from God for you. <laughs> Sorry. As King Eglon rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, pulled the dagger straps to his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. The dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger, and the, he left it in there as evidence, and the king's bowels emptied. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> then Ehud closed and locked the door uh, of the room and escaped down the latrine. Ministry's not glamorous. <laughs> Verse 24. And after Ehud was gone, the king's servants returned and found the doors to the upstairs room locked. And they thought he might be using the latrine in his room, so they waited. But when the king didn't come out after a long delay, they became concerned and got a key. And when they opened the doors, they found their master dead on the floor. Ehud was an unlikely deliverer for Israel. Nobody around him expected him to do what he did. He didn't tell anybody. It doesn't, it doesn't appear from the text all just knew the Lord had spoken to him. He had a word. He had a disabled right hand. The king, the king said, sure, I'll take a bribe. Give me a secret message from God. The king underestimated the left-handed man with a dagger from the Lord. Never underestimate somebody with some courage. Never underestimate someone with a passion for God. Never underestimate somebody who has a destiny and a mission from God and is on assignment. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from what is heard. Faith comes from hearing. It's time to activate the word that God has been spoken, that God has spoken to you. What is it that, what promise has God spoken to you? It's time to activate that word. Psalm 62, 11 says, once God has spoken and twice I have heard. When, when, God, when God speaks, he don't have to speak again. He just speaks one time. When I had my encounter with the Lord, I was 28 years old. I had my encounter with the Lord. I said to the Lord, you never have to speak again to me. That's how strong it was. I was afraid. I, I was, it was so, that visitation was so powerful, so strong. I didn't think I could handle it. And it was, it was over so fast. It was just so fast. And then I, then I just, I went for weeks and weeks and weeks well, actually for years off that encounter, but, but for weeks it was uh, food didn't matter, ministry did nothing matter, only the Lord's presence mattered. It was, it was an amazing encounter. And what I can say is once the Lord has spoken, I don't, I don't think he's speaking again. If he gave you a promise, then he said what he said. But David says, twice I've heard it. How you hear it twice if he only said it once? Echo, echo. What God says in the heavens bounces off the earth and you get to hear it twice. Once I have spoken, twice I have heard. In other words, when God gives you a promise, he may only speak to you one time about it. Well, where are the specifics? Where are the plans? You said this was gonna happen. I don't know what you said. I don't understand. Where is it all at? I'm saying stick to what he said. Trust in what he said. Your promise is your 
invisible, is, is in the invisible realm and it exists there before it exists here. When he first spoke, I didn't hear him speak at first. I had to be ready to hear him speak. But he had already before the foundation. In other words, God has spoken. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8. Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter into that rest. But if we disobey God, and as the people of Israel did when they didn't include God, we will fail. For the word of God is alive, say alive, and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest, what? two-edged sword, which would be basically kind of like a what? A dagger. Cutting between soul and spirit and between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires and nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Are you tracking with me? You can take your left hand, you can take your right hand, but whatever you do, take a hold of the promises of God and stand on those promises and whatever the enemy brings to you, you say, I'm not taking that. Not taking that back up. I'm not taking that. I don't believe that lie. I'm not receiving that lie. The word, the promise, is sharp. The Holy Spirit is not going to give you specifics. He's just going to tell you what he heard. Let's go to John 16. I'm going to skip, skip all this and get down to the conclusion here. John 16. The band can go ahead and come. There is so much more I want to tell you, Jesus says. This is John 16, 12, verse 12. But you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. Say, he, he will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. So the Holy Spirit is not this force in the universe. The Holy Spirit has ears and intellect. He can hear. And the Holy Spirit will tell you what he heard. So if God says you're healed and the Holy Spirit brings a dream or comes and tells you something and says you're healed, well, look to your neighbor and say, then you're healed because God said it. In other words, I don't want you to be afraid for me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want you to be afraid for us. What I want you to do is get into the text and apply it to your life. He will not speak on his own. The Holy Spirit doesn't come to make you, you know, just feel happy. He's just speaking what he will, verse 14, he will tell you about what? The future. The Holy Spirit is always about moving you into your destiny. He'll tell you about the future. He will bring me glory, Jesus says, by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. In other words, the Father has sent the Son, the Son has sent the Spirit, and the Spirit is still talking in the universe. The Spirit has some stuff he wants to tell you that has been planned at the conference tables in heaven. A plan for you to succeed and for you to win and for you to overcome and not be overwhelmed by the devil's plans and plots for your life. I think, I think we have to access, like the parable, we have to take the silver bags that have been given to us and we take that and we declare it on a Sunday morning and we plant, we, we say, I'm gonna invest this, I'm gonna invest this so that when the master returns, there's a massive harvest. The Holy Spirit never says anything on his own. The Holy Spirit is always reminding you what he's already heard. The Holy Spirit is not giving you specifics. He's just said, this is what's gonna happen. So that means if you had a word that your business was gonna prosper, then I would stick with what God said and not with what Wall Street says. I would stick with what the Lord has told you to do. 
If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the, by the word, we need the Lord to actually speak and give us a word that you would get a word for you, that you would learn to hear his voice. So I had this message, I had it, had it in my heart, had it, love that story where Ehud just steps up and lets the fat king have it. And the king is just like dead. And I just thought I had the message finished. And this morning, I had the craziest thought. So I'm going to obey the Lord. Amen? So be sure and do exactly what I say because this came to me just like the Lord brought it, brought it to me. So whether there's one or five or ten, I want you to put up your hand. Put up your hand if you've been praying for Whitney. If you've been praying for Whitney, look at that. Now this is crazy. This, is, this came to me by the word of the Lord, so I'm gonna do it. This is so crazy. If, if, and let me read it exactly how it came. So keep your hand up. If you believe somehow when you're praying somewhere, God affirmed to you that she would be healed or you had a dream or a strong impression or even a word kind of in your spirit and you went, this is taken care of. This, I know, I, I know that this it is more than just me hoping she gets healed. This is a word from the Lord. I want you to put up your other hand. If you've had, oh my gosh. So if you have both hands raised, I want you to stand. I want you to stand. You say, I believe God told me. Oh my gosh. Can I take, can you take a photo of this? Oh my gosh. So I believe this is a moment for our church. Healing is in the hands. What are you saying? I believe God has told me this. We've received so many notes and emails and visions. And you need to know Whitney is leaning into the Lord. It's just now we have a time limit. Now we need God to show up. We need a visit. And we don't need him to touch the symptoms. We need the healer to show up. I'm going to invite everybody else to stand. Did you get a photo? I want everybody else to stand. I want you to put both hands up. Everybody put both hands up. Put both hands up. that the glory of the Lord would be manifested in this city. That jaded 20-somethings would come to know there is a God in Israel. Holy Spirit, we stand. We can do nothing else but stand on your word. We stand on your word. They say it's impossible, Lord, but we believe that all things are possible. They say there's no medicine left to try, but we say, Lord, you are our medicine. We pray all delay and obstacles out of the way. Now let's just raise our voice in prayer and intercede for your worship pastor right now. Would you do that, Father? In the name of Jesus as a church, we, we stand, Lord, over a hundred people stood that said you had spoken to them. They, they had an assurance, a, a sense, Lord, that you, you spoke once and we all heard the same thing, that this is not God's destiny for this daughter. In the name of Jesus, we claim this. And Lord, I pray over the children and the grandchildren of every hand that's raised. I pray that the way they have prayed for our daughter that their own children will reap the benefits, that their grandchildren will have a legacy of understanding, that a revival will break out in our children, and our children's children will talk about this turning point, this place of crossing over in the name of Jesus. Let's give God praise. Let's give God praise for what he's done. Hallelujah. Yes, I won't stop. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We praise you as if it's done. She'll be on this stage at Christmas. 
Now, now that's me speaking prophetically. But God is going to show up. Now, I've got to finish what the Lord told me. I want to invite the prayer team and any deacons, deaconesses, trustees and wives and uh, elders and spouses. I want you to come and stand at the front. Now, this is an activation moment that the Lord has put into play. Come and stand at the front and face the audience. If you are here and say, Pastor, there I have been given a word and there is such a delay, I don't even know what's taken so long, but I'm wanting God to release the promise, release the promise that he made to me. While we sing this song, this new song, Crossing Over, which Whitney picked, by the way. This, <laughs> you know, she knows exactly what she's doing when she's picking songs. She picked this song, and I want you to cross over into the promises, into the destiny. So as we sing this, you come down for prayer, and then we'll, I'm going to speak a blessing over you right after this song, and, and we'll let you go. Come right now if you need prayer. Come right now. Come ahead. Go ahead. Hey, we cross over to your promise. We walk.
envisioned starting a business with you in the middle of it. Those that have pictured themselves becoming the manager over a store or a floor or being elevated into a level of influence. God, in the name of Jesus, we pray over your people right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray, I pray this will, this will cause a, a mighty surge among the young people. I pray for the drifting hearts. I pray for those that used to attend church that have just moved away from the institutional church. God, I pray that you wouldn't bring them back to an institutional church, but you would bring them back to your heart, that they would discover your caring and loving heart and the plans and the dreams and the destinies you have for them and the community of faith that you're wanting to provide for them. Change us, make us what you want us to be, Lord. We thank you in this moment. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. Well, let's give God thanks for all that he's done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know Whitney and Alan would want me to tell you just how grateful they are. Look, emotionally and spiritually, they are, they are doing not only as good as you could do, they are, they are both my heroes, both of them with such courage and, and confidence in the Lord. But it's, it's that critical time. It's the ninth inning. And we need the Lord to just take care of this. Amen. Amen. I love you. We love you, church. We're grateful for you. God bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you next Sunday. Bye-bye.